our scripture text that our uh, speaker is going to be uh, speaking from is found in Matthew 10, 29. Through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are well all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more value than many sparrows. Our speaker this morning is no stranger to us. He's been here before. The Reverend Ralph E. Young Jr. is an ordained elder of the United Methodist Church. Uh, the Lord called him into ministry in 1961 at the age of 13. He was first appointed as a student supply pastor at the age of 17 in 1965. He has served four annual conferences, including Western Pennsylvania, East Ohio, Saskawana in central Pennsylvania and Florida. He was ordained a deacon in 1970 and an elder in 1973. He retired in 2014 with 49 years of service. With his wife, Deb, he moved from Florida to Versailles, Kentucky, where they built their forever home, situated in the bluegrass and surrounded by horse farms. They have five adult children, 16 grandchildren, living in Pennsylvania, Florida, Idaho, and Kentucky. In February 2016, Pastor Ralph was employed by the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home as a youth care associate. He worked directly with the girls and boys in their daily living routine for three and a half years. Within the first year, Pastor Ralph was asked to share about the ministries of the children's home with the congregations of the Kentucky Conference. Since then, Pastor Ralph has spoken in churches in every part of the state. In 2019, he was asked to join the development department as development coordinator. He is delighted to share with you today from his unique perspective and experience in the ministry of the children's home. Our church has been faithful in, uh, for a long time. Even though our numbers are few, we lead uh, the district in proportionate giving, and I'm sure we'll do that again this year, and we are proud to support Methodist Home and uh, proud to have uh, Pastor Young today. Please come. Well, good morning. It's good to be back with you today. I have so enjoyed uh, the opportunity to be with you in the past and uh, took happy uh, memories back with me from the last time that I was here with you uh, to share with you from the children's home. And uh, it's, uh, it's a joy today to uh, have this opportunity once again. Last time I was here, I shared with you a couple of stories about two young men uh, who were in uh, treatment at the United Methodist Children's Home. And today, uh, my plan is to share with you stories about two young ladies uh, that have been uh, in our care uh, in the past. Uh, it is, it's so, uh, so nice to be with you today and to just celebrate the fact uh, that, that we're able to gather for worship. You know, it's, it's just wonderful that uh, even with uh, the, uh, the restrictions and the care that we need to take uh, regarding uh, the situations uh, surrounding the pandemic, that we still can gather to worship. And you know, uh, what we're doing, uh, we personally, my wife and I, uh, we meet with a small group uh, once a week for a, for a prayer meeting, prayer fellowship, and then we meet another time during the week uh, with another group uh, to do Bible study, and just small groups, but, but we keep that sense of community uh, alive, and, and, uh, and that sense of working together, building one another up in the family of believers. So I'm so glad to greet you this morning, and thank you uh, for the warm welcome that you've already extended to me. This uh, passage of scripture that was read uh, from Matthew 10, 29 to 31, Jesus is speaking there specifically about how God cares for us. He cares for us in the, in the big things and in the small things. Uh, when, when, we give the, when Jesus gives this, uh, this illustration of sparrows, 
uh, that, that's an illustration that really uh, kind of speaks to me because my family and I uh, love birds. We invite the birds into our yard. Uh, we have uh, a couple of feeders out and, uh, and even a hummingbird feeder. All summer long, we, we, are just, we have birds coming and going. Uh, during the spring, when, we, uh, when, when the birds are migrating, uh, we'll have uh, birds that only uh, come and stop with us for maybe a couple of days, maybe a week at the most. Uh, and we get to see them and, and, uh, and enjoy uh, like a red breast or a rose breasted grosbeak. I mean, we only see that bird and his mate once in a while uh, in the spring, usually right around Easter. But it brings such joy to us to see that and, and, to, and to learn a little bit about uh, the way that birds work together, socialize together, take care of each other, raise their young. Uh, it's just amazing to, to learn all of those things. But you know, of all the birds that come uh, into our yard and, and enjoy uh, the, uh, the food, the water, and the cover that we provide, sparrows are always there. They're always there. Um, and you know, I've, I've really come to appreciate and enjoy uh, the beauty of sparrows and, and, and the variety of sparrows. Uh, I was amazed listening one day, I thought it was a mockingbird I was hearing, and it was a song sparrow. The song is beautiful. And so, and so those of you that, that know what I'm talking about um, uh, realize just how much joy uh, these tiny little jewels of God's uh, creatures uh, can bring to us. But Jesus says, um, uh, a sparrow, uh, two for a penny. <laughs> Uh, do, do you know you know that a dollar's worth of sparrows uh, is it, like what, what would that be? Two hundred sparrows? That's that's amazing. And God, even though we place so little value on a sparrow, God knows everything about them. Everything, the big things, the little things. The big things would be if a sparrow falls to the ground. That's you know when a sparrow dies. God knows about it. God cares about it. And, and, and so God knows and cares about us. Jesus said, you're worth much more than many, many sparrows. The, the, uh, the translation, free translation of the Message uh, Bible is this. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And, and God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He even pays greater attention to you down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by bully talk. You're worth more than a million sparrows. When I think about how God cares about me, I think God cares about me more than I care about myself sometimes. And, and, and the evidence of that is that God even counts the hairs on my head. Um, I've never done that. <laughs> and I, 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 I know, for instance, uh, a mother. Uh, I'm thinking of Joe and Leah. Joe and Leah were uh, and are members of our life group. And, uh, and, and Leah and Joe had tried for many years to, to conceive a child. Uh, and it got to the place where they had, it's very expensive, and, and got to the place where, where they had enough money for one more try. And so Leah said to us, please pray for us. Uh, uh, pray, pray for me. Because uh, she, in every other opportunity they had had, uh, she carried the child for a brief time and lost it. She says, this is our last chance. Please pray. And, uh, and so they went through the procedures and, and she conceived. And, and so she would give us week by week uh, her progress report, how she was doing. Um, and, and how the doctor was saying that the, uh, that the pregnancy was progressing. And it got to the point where she was beyond uh, uh, that threshold where she had lost the children before. And she was so anxious. And, and finally, uh, it was like the doctor says, next week is the day I'm going in to deliver the child. Pray for us. Pray for us. And so finally, finally the child was born, and, and, and the child thrived. 
Uh, but Leah was so solicitous for the care of this child. She took note of every little detail and, and she was concerned. She talked with her doctor, call her doctor up if, if there was any sign that maybe there was, she, uh, little Arabella was not, was not hitting this particular mark in her development and her growth. Uh, and she was concerned. So she, and every little thing that happened, if Arabella had, uh, you know, things that we parents know, these are all things that usually happen with a newborn, but this was all new to Leah. She was so careful. And so we went over, I remember when they finally brought the baby home. We went over to their home and, uh, and we uh, met little Arabella. My wife and I uh, held her and, and, and then uh, we noticed that uh, when we handed her back to Leah, uh, she uh, lovingly brushed her hair with one of those very, very soft brushes, you know. You know what I'm talking about. And I noticed when she laid the brush down, there were a few hairs. Arabella's hair is in the brush. But you know, as careful as Leah was about every detail of little Arabella, it didn't bother her in the least that Arabella had lost a few hairs. God knew about those hairs. Think about, think about the way in which God knows and cares about every aspect of our life. Uh, and when I think about that, I think that, uh, that we, should, we should have certain things should happen to us in our spirit, in our mind, in our heart. Um, whenever we think about how, how deeply God cares about us, that should help us to be people of, of, of faith. It should help us to be bold because God is in control. He knows everything that's happening. He knows what's going to happen next. And God has us. We need not be afraid. That was the point of Jesus' teaching. Do not be afraid. He said in, in, his, in the Sermon on the Mount, a few chapters earlier in Matthew 6, Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. Uh, they do not sow, they do not reap, or store away into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? So do not worry. Your heavenly Father knows your needs. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Everything else. Everything else will be cared for and provided for you. So God is our provider. We need never be afraid. We should have a steady and calm mind, a calm assurance in our soul. As the way Paul put it, I know whom I believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. As believers, we should be bold and we should live boldly. We should know that we are valued, our worth is incalculable because God says so and because God paid an ultimate price for our salvation. That should, that should stir your faith and cause its roots to go deep. I want to tell you though about, about boys and girls that have never experienced a sense of being valued. See, there's a sharp, a sharp contrast between what we as people of faith have come to know about ourselves and our God and those children who've been abused, neglected, and abandoned. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a real chasm that's missing in their experience. They have no experience of being valued. They do not know the truth that they are a child of God, that, that they have incalculable worth. They need to hear it. They need to believe it, that God loves them so much that He's given His only Son, that they should not perish, but have eternal life. They need to receive through the loving and consistent giving of confidence that their needs are going to be met. I think of, a, of this one uh, first story about this young girl. Her name is Lily. Lily um, walks with a white stick. She's legally blind. 
and, uh, and Lily uh, felt as though uh, when, she, when she came to us, you know, she was shy, withdrawn, most of the kids are when they first come to us, but, but with her, it was, it was as if uh, she, she felt like she was always being overlooked, and I, uh, and I don't mean that as a pun. <laughs> uh, she really did feel like she was, she, uh, she was invisible, that they didn't see her. Um, and, and so there were times whenever she would, um, would really get vocal about, hey, I'm here. Um, pay attention to me. I, I, this is what I want. Um, I remember that uh, this has only been a couple of months ago now. Um, we had a group of volunteers that were, that they decided that what they would like to do is make a birthday cake and bring it every time that one of our residents had a birthday. Well, the girls' birthdays uh, come kind of quickly, one after another, uh, pretty much so. Uh, the boys are more spread out, but, but the girls uh, were getting birthday cakes, and the guys were getting a birthday cake. And, and uh, there was one day that we had something planned there that was, had nothing to do with birthdays, and, and, but it happened to be one boy's birthday, and it was like, we had set up the gym, and we had you know bouncy houses and all kinds of special things going on that day, and and the one boy who's having the birthday thought it was for his birthday, <laughs> and the other boys who had already had a birthday said, "I didn't get that for my birthday," you know, and, and that's it wasn't for the birthday at all. He had his cake, but he got to eat it too. So anyway, but but my point is this: Lily had seen the girls getting birthday cakes. One day, somebody drives up. Lily is out for a walk uh, with, with her youth care associate, and they turn the corner there uh, at the front of the building and start to walk along the side. This lady has pulled in to where we receive deliveries, and, and she got out of her car, and she was carrying a birthday cake. Immediately, uh, Lily was able to get a sense you know, of what was going on. She could s tell that much, and she ran up to this person, and she got right in their face. And she demanded, who is that for? Who's getting that cake? And the volunteer calmly took out a piece of paper, looked at it, and said the name of the person getting the cake. Lily was stunned. She said, that's my name. That's my name. You mean that cake is for me? Yeah, Lily, happy birthday. And she was just, you know, so excited, uh, so happy that she was remembered, valued on her birthday. But the one thing that she had been asking for over and over and over again, she had been asking for a Bible. She said, every other, every other person, every other girl, every other boy has gotten a Bible. The, the chaplains have written in their Bible. Uh, they've all gotten a Bible, um, but why can't I have a Braille Bible? She begged. I didn't know about this until after she'd been there a couple of months. One of my associates said to me, Ralph, we have been looking everywhere. We've been online. We have been uh, uh, you know, gone and uh, to different uh, publishing houses and so on. We can't find the Braille Bible. The only one we can find is like six hundred dollars. Can you? Maybe you can help us. I said, sure, I'll I'll try. <laughs> I just put in on Google Braille Bible, and then I just started scrolling down. I called CBD. I you know I I call them a lot. Christian book distributors. And they said, yeah, we have, we have one, um, about $70 or so. Uh, called uh, called a, another, I don't know, was it Abington? I don't remember. But I made several calls, and yeah, we have, we have Braille Bibles. But then I saw one um, out of Terre Haute, Indiana. And I clicked on that, and then I uh, picked up the phone and called these people. And this is what I discovered. Their ministry is to produce Braille Bibles every time a blind person requests one, they make one. 
And, and uh, she described to me, uh, or asked me, what level does, does she read at? I said, well, let me check. And so I found that out, level one. Level one is where, where every letter of every word is on the Braille page. Now you can imagine, if you've ever seen Braille, that that would make a huge volume. <clears throat> so she said, we have everything in level two. I said, what is level two? She said, it's called contracted Braille, it's, and, and a, a person learns to read that. Someone who, who's been reading level one uh, progresses to level two. And so level two is where, for instance, an example of what it would be like for us, is if you took out every vowel out of every word, you would still be able to read the text. Your mind fills in the vowels. And so you'd still be able to read it. Well, contracted Braille is similar to that. And so the, the person would learn, the blind person would learn, how to read level two Braille. And so I said, OK, um, how about the whole Bible? She said, well, <laughs> Reverend Young, the whole Bible takes up five feet of shelf space. She said, but we do have the New Testament and Psalms. I said, OK. And she said, that's five volumes. Uh, OK. Um, I said, anything in a single volume? She said, well, yes, we do. We have a book called uh, Words of Life, and it's a single volume of New Testament texts, which are you know, like promise texts, uh, faith-building texts. And uh, she said, we happen to have those in stock. And I said, how soon can you send it? She said, we can send it this week. So I called up my uh, associate, and I, I said to her, I found us a Bible. They're going to send it this week. It'll be here in a few days. <laughs> An hour had passed from the time I learned about this. I'm not, I'm not taking credit. I'm just saying that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit opened those doors for Lily. The Bible arrived, and um, it was in a box about like this, about that thick. I opened it up, and it's like, wow, look at this. It's all it was, it's just white, but it's got texture to it, you know? And you can run your fingers over it. Um, and it, was, it had printed on it, you know, what it was. Um, and, and I don't know if Lily could have read that or not, but, but anyway. Um, so I said, here it is. Within a week, they had put that in a, a box, wrapped it up. The, the chaplains had written something in it. I don't know if Lily could have read those things anyway. Somebody may have read, had to read it to her. But they took her out of the lunchroom and said, you've got to wait while the rest of the girls go back to their routine. And so uh, everybody else left. Lily's there sitting with her worker. And she's really getting a little anxious. She thinks she's in trouble. Finally, they come in. They bring in the book, and, uh, or the box, and ask her to guess what's in the box. <clears throat> she says, I have no idea. So they handed her the box. She opened it up. And all she could see was just white. But then she touched it. And she knew immediately what it was. She said, it's a Bible. She took it out of the box, held it like this. She said, I love this book. Thank you. She said, I'm not going to cry. But as uh, they took her back to the cottage, there were tears in her eyes running down her face. These kids need to know they are loved. And they are cared for. And it's just simple little things like that that make the difference. I want to tell you a story about Anya. Anya uh, was born in the Soviet state of the Ukraine. Her birth mother gave her up for adoption as soon as she was born. Anya was shortly thereafter adopted by a United States military couple who were stationed uh, in her birth country. She was a year old when she was adopted in what was to be her forever family. And during her early childhood, uh, her father was deployed to several countries in Europe. 
And uh, Anya would often talk about those times uh, whenever she was encouraged uh, to talk about them. And uh, her earliest memories are of cities in Europe. Uh, she'd tell stories of those happier times, but always uh, in a melancholy way. When the family eventually moved back to the United States, uh, Anya's adoptive grandmother moved in with the family, and grandmother had difficulty bonding with Anya, and Anya's response was viewed negatively by her parents. After several painful confrontations, Anya's adoptive parents uh, requested that Anya be removed from their home. Attempts to resolve the family conflicts through adoptive family services uh, were not successful. And the uh, adoptive parents insisted uh, that uh, Anya be removed. And so she was placed in state's care in Kentucky. She was accepted into the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home for residential treatment just prior to her 15th birthday. She was enrolled in our six-month program, and uh, she was shy and withdrawn when she first met with staff and her peers because she had an obvious, uh, an obvious handicap. Uh, she uh, had uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, she she was, uh, had a pronounced limp. Uh, her right side didn't work well. Her arm was not, didn't have full function. And, uh, and so uh, she, was, uh, uh, she was at first bullied by the other boys and girls. But within uh, a moments of that happening, uh, the staff realized what was going on, and, and they uh, immediately uh, squelched that behavior on the part of her peers. Uh, staff gave Anya positive verbal encouragement and support, and within days, uh, the rest of the boys and girls responded to that positive uh, uh, example modeled by the staff. Anya never allowed her cerebral palsy to define her, nor did she excuse herself from participating in recreational activities to the extent that she was able. And her peers came to respect her um, and, and even be became protective of her. She was an excellent student at the Ashford Academy, which is the, uh, the accredited high school that is right there on campus uh, for our boys and girls. Uh, she made steady progress, achieving her daily academic goals. She progressed through the six phases of her treatment program and timely completed her six-month plan. A greater challenge presented for Anya every time, however, that a visit was scheduled with her parents. Um, several visits, day visits on campus and at-home visits over the weekend uh, and holidays were scheduled, but uh, but Anya's adoptive parents never honored a single visitation. And, and uh, Anya, in, in phone calls with her parents, uh, all the phone calls, as you may know, are monitored. And so I, when I would sit uh, with Anya while she was on the phone with her, uh, with her family, <clears throat> uh, she was always very polite, um, always asked after, you know, uh, siblings and other family members, uh, how, how they were, um, and, and that was just part of who she was. But, but those conversations almost always ended with Anya in tears, because she felt that, uh, that her family was holding her at arm's length, making no initiative to welcome her back home or even include her in their lives. So as a result, um, Anya remained in the care of the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home for another year and a half. Uh, she learned that uh, one day uh, when I went in to, to work, uh, she was, she looked better than I'd ever seen her. <laughs> uh, she was really, she looked very, very nice. And uh, she said, Mr. Ralph, I'm going home today. I, I was, I was sh really surprised. And she said, I'm going home today. Uh, my parents are going to come and get me today. And, and the time came for the parents to arrive. And, uh, and she wasn't there. They weren't there. Um, dinner time came. Anya went to dinner, but she only really just picked something up and wanted to come back to the cottage. And then it got to be dark, and there was a phone call. 
that came to uh, the youth care worker, her counselor. The counselor came over to the cottage and uh, asked for Anya to come into the office uh, with us, uh, one, uh, one, of the, one of her uh, youth care workers, and she said, um, Anya, um, your parents won't be coming today. In fact, um, they've left the country, they've moved back to Europe, and they just called us a little while ago. That was such a, a blow to Anya. Um, I remember seeing her just sobbing and just quivering. Did you know that the name Sparrow comes from the word to quiver? Anya and I used to take walks around the perimeter of the gymnasium, sometimes whenever the other boys and girls were doing things that Anya couldn't participate in. And she and I would talk. After that day, when we were walking around the perimeter of the gymnasium, Anya said to me, Mr. Ralph, nobody loves me. I have no family. Nobody cares. And I said to her, I said, Anya, do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God cares about sparrows, those little birds that are outside your window. Nothing happens to them that God doesn't know about it. And nothing will happen to you that God doesn't know. God loves you, Anya. And God has a plan for your life. It took her quite a while, a couple of weeks, maybe a month and a half, something like that. She finally, she finally began to feel something was changing for her. She really began to believe what I was saying to her, what others were saying to her. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. And that's Psalm 27.10. Isaiah 49.15. Can a woman forget her nursing child, not have compassion on the child of her womb? Surely some may forget, yet I will not forget you. Even if your family, your friends are, uh, are, are uh, uh, forsake you, you will always be cherished by God. Jeremiah 31.3, yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I've drawn you to myself. So, Anya, listen, God's love for you is relentless. It is immeasurable. It is everlasting and infinite. Anya faithfully attended the chapel services uh, while she was with us, and she continues to worship on Sunday mornings at the Source, United Methodist Church in Lexington. And Pastor Jill there um, uh, and the church family are a great joy to Anya. When she celebrated her 17th birthday, she became eligible for placement in uh, our uh, independent living program. And that's where she is now. Uh, she lives in her own apartment. She's got her high school diploma. She is well-adjusted, self-confident young woman. She, is, uh, she, she has a job where she works locally. Uh, she's learning how to, how to uh, uh, budget her money, how to, how to uh, do the things that we all take just for granted, how to, how to balance a checkbook, how to, how to plan ahead for, for utilities and, and food and, and transportation, all those things she's learning. A few months ago, she was back on campus for one day with others from ILP. And... Uh, I had the chance to say hi to her. I said, hey, Anya, good to see you. I hear good things about you. She said, yes, Mr. Ralph, that's true. And she said, uh, she said, I want to tell you something, Mr. Ralph. Remember when I said to you, I have no family, that I, that I am not cared for, I'm not loved? She said, Mr. Ralph, 
I am loved. I know I'm loved. And I do have a family. And she went like this. This is my family. The children's home is my family. You know, we're part of that family. See, the United Methodist Children's Home is an extension of your ministry right here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the way you support us. Thank you for your prayers. That's the most important support. Thank you for your giving. You are making a difference in the lives of these boys and girls. Those lives are being transformed. The trajectory of their lives is being affected in a positive way that helps them to grow into the truth of who they really are, God's children, children of great worth and value. You're giving them that message. Thank you.